Welcome back to the Adventures in Advising podcast. This is Matt Markin, and we are at episode 89. And since the podcast returned back in May of this year, I have not had any guest hosts. So, well, that changes today as we bring back returning guest, returning host, and all-around great guy and friend of the pod, Ryan Sheckle from Texas Tech University. Ryan, take it away. Well, thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me back. And it's great to have another a friend of the podcast on as uh, an interviewee again. Um, I know Craig has interviewed some folks, and, and I think we're maybe finding our footing with this podcast modality. But uh, I want to introduce Dr. Craig McGill. He's an assistant professor uh, for the Department of Special Education, Counseling, and Student Affairs at Kansas State University. He holds a doctorate from Florida National University in adult education and human resource development. Dr. McGill is a quantitative qualitative researcher, <laughs> qualitative researcher, focused on social justice and the professionalization of academic advising. And he has also published articles within fields of musical theater studies and queer studies. Craig has given almost 60 advising related presentations at Nakata State Regional, Annual and International Conferences. And his publication record consists of two co-edited books and over 30 peer reviewed articles. Again, welcome, Craig. Thank you so much, Ryan and Matt. Uh, very excited to be here this afternoon. We had the sort of the joy of revisiting uh, episodes to prepare for for interviews, and and uh, um, I was honored to be on what was edited into the first episode of the podcast in its first iteration, um, and you were part of the second. But it was functionally the same day for Matt. Um, it was uh, in Louisville in 2019, interviewing folks at the annual conference there. I didn't and, know that. Yeah, and so we were sort of part second. of the first set of content. And we've been in a lot of places um, together, and we haven't really had too many opportunities to just have conversations one-on-one, -on -one, um, yeah. a lot of great group discussions and stuff. So I'm glad for this opportunity and for this time. Yeah. Uh, so in your previous appearances on the podcast, there have been some topics of discussion that weren't really a, a focus, but just sort of talking about your journey and your experience and academic advising and and how you've moved from institutions and roles. And, and I wanted to pick apart uh, some of those and, and maybe give them their own focus. You have spent some time uh, talking about your scholarship and your collaboration with others in producing scholarship on the topic of the professionalization of academic advising. And since it's been a while since you were on talking about that specifically, I was wondering if you could update us uh, sort of where you're at with that conversation, maybe where the conversation stands for the field. Um, where are we at with professionalization and academic advising? Oh, that's great. Yeah, professionalization is is really important for us, um, and it's it's a it's it's an umbrella that covers a lot of different things uh, that are important for us as a field to consider. Um, and so, some of those we're going to be talking about today. I think. We still have a PR problem as a field. I think we have not convinced higher ups of the importance and value of the work that advisors do. Uh, and so that is why I am so passionate about about this. And um, even though I'm a faculty member now, you know, maybe some of the, the viewers will know that I was a primary role advisor for nine years. And I just knew that the work we were doing was more important than the uh, recognition uh, that we were being given by various uh, stakeholders. And so I'm a little bit surprised that, you know, uh, I've been in the field for maybe 15 years at this point, and we've come so far, but I don't think the progress has been sufficiently recognized. Uh, and so I think the professionalization umbrella helps us to do that. It helps us to think about what it means uh, to to be an advisor. What does it mean to have caseloads that are 500, 700, 1,000? How can we have meaningful conversations with students uh, with that type of a caseload? And the only way to address this, I think, is to convince uh, those higher ups who have the capacity to to shape the caseload size uh, so that advisors, uh, you know, have, you know, the space and the uh, resources to have those meaningful conversations with students. Um, because what it means is we, we lose very talented people uh, who come in and, you know, aren't able to to give the the thoughtful practice that they have the capacity for. 
but in their current roles don't have the ability to uh, perform. So uh, that's that's the main thing I would say about this. And so um, this involves research and publication. Uh, we need to demonstrate empirically effectiveness. We need to demonstrate need empirically and otherwise. And we need to be publishing in venues outside of our own. Um, our own venues are are very important place as well. But if we want to reach other audiences, we need to be publishing in higher education journals uh, writ large. And so I really haven't started anything new since I appeared last. Most of of, of what I'm working on now is uh, continuing the work I've, I've started with uh, just a variety of collaborators. So uh, and... I think also just another thing we need to acknowledge is I've said empirical like 700 times, but there are other ways uh, of knowledge uh, creation. And I think the quantitative stuff is very important, but it's not the only route. Sure. And so, for yeah. our listeners who are listening uh, to Craig for the maybe the first time here, um, I do want to encourage you to go back uh, and, and find previous uh, episodes um, where Dr. McGill is talking about the research and the work and the scholarship and the publication and the knowledge. In particular, one of the threads uh, that I heard in listening to your previous appearances was this idea about multiple ways of knowing mm-hmm. the value that is inherently there. And again, it wasn't a feature or a focus of any of the conversations, but it was a, a through line in um, when talking about where academic advisors come from. Um, sort of our academic identities and our academic academic backgrounds, and then the fit or alignment or misfit or alignment when we're working with students maybe outside of those. Um, but the value of multiple ways of knowing um, is a part of, I think, your philosophical center as mm-hmm. a scholar. And I'm I'm curious if uh, we could talk a little bit, just a bit, um, in the middle of this discussion about professionalization, about your uh, background with music theory um, and uh, advising in a STEM field um, when when you're doing that, having that academic uh, preparation. Yeah, I, I love that. And I don't know what this is, what you're referring to, but my advising career started uh, advising biochemistry and forensic science, which I loved. I thought that was so fun. And I learned so much uh, about those fields, not necessarily in terms of anything beyond a layman's understanding of the concepts in the field, but learning to have conversation with people working in these fields and preparing students to work in these fields. Um, yeah, uh, music theory, uh, this is a fun anecdote. Uh, my One of my mentors in the field is, is Dr. Peter Hagen, uh, just, just a wonderful man. And we were talking about music and uh, he encouraged me to think about uh, pieces of music that I thought every advisor should should listen to. And I don't know that I have a satisfactory response at this point, but it got me thinking more about the interdisciplinarity of our work um, and and thinking about um, how what I learned in, in music theory uh, could translate to to advising students and thinking through some of these things. Um, and, you know, I think these are important conversations to think about individually, but also with our students and and thinking about the transferable skills. How does, uh, you know, uh, outlining the harmonic scheme of a sonata prepare me to, to do X, Y, or Z out in the real world? Um, and... Uh, there's there's a there's many musicians in Nakata, and uh, I think it would be fun at some point just to have a meeting with them about you know how has music you know prepared you for for this wonderful field. But yeah, it's it's a fun question. I don't know that I have an answer today, but yeah, well, you should be working on the playlist at minimum uh, because yeah. there will be listeners. My experience has been, especially when um, we're kicking around in maybe popular culture, um, visual media, and, uh, yeah. and visual arts. Um, that there's a, a lot of traction there. And there have been, of course, scholars who have articulated why. Um, and I think that that for my professional journey and engaging with scholarship, um, I don't know that anyone necessarily needs to legitimize their convictions um, and their certainties about the nature of the work that we do. 
But it is really wonderful when an expert in a field who has devoted their time to exploring these concepts says, yeah, this is why it works. Yeah. Um, and I can assure you uh, that the transferable skills, perspectives, and at minimum, the metaphors, even though uh, analogies and metaphors sometimes work against our goals in professionalization, um, they're there for sure. So if someone's like, yeah, I, that we should have a playlist for advisors, we absolutely should. Um, so just a little bit again, given um, our time, what does continuing uh, the research look like? I think one of the things we need to think about is is primary role advisors. I mean, this isn't anything new, but I think it's a continued issue. Um, primary role advisors have so much to offer, observations they see in their own practice, um, stuff from their own academic training even, uh, that is untapped for um, the research. I have the luxury of being in a faculty position where I'm evaluated on research as part of my job, but most people in the field are not in that position. And so we need to figure out ways of making uh, scholarship uh, and conducting scholarship more possible. And I think that is directly related to the first thing I said about our PR issue and, you know, going to, to Troxel's work on scholarly advising, you know, thinking about how we not only perform scholarly advising, but how do we convey the message that advisors uh, are scholar practitioners and need um, not only training and opportunities, but actual time. Time is a resource just as much as anything. You know, I often say I never would have left my advising role had I been able to do research and have it counted as part of that. But, you know, I was doing it on evenings and weekends, and that's just not sustainable. So I think we need to think through how we make that possible for primary role advisors. And one thing I would like to see is how can we pair it, primary role advisors with uh, perhaps faculty advisors on, on campuses who do have the training, who have the job expectation of doing research, and who have the ability, in some cases, this is the most important thing, to be a primary investigator, sorry, PI, uh, for the IRBs on their campus. How can we build these partnerships or help build these partnerships? Um, I think that might be one solution uh, to get uh, more research conducted on college campuses. Um, so I think that that's, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that among the sort of the thoughts that led in that question is there are structures, structures that have to be in place to continue one's research, one's line of inquiry. Um, certainly uh, when primary role advisors get to the point where they're like, yes, I'm going to act on this question that's been raised and I'm going to pursue this line of inquiry towards something that leads to a, a presentation, a publication, collection of information, data, whatever you want to call it, perspectives for the, the, the research, that the effort alone to sort of navigate, break through, overcome those structural barriers um, is one of the things that maybe keeps the next step from happening. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that in your role at uh, K-State, because you're in that faculty role, that continuing your line of inquiry, continuing to collaborate with uh, fellow researchers is part of the day. It's yeah. a normal part of your structure now um, that can become part of a primary role advisor's structure. Um, but there are uh, there are other barriers to making that so, including the the caseload and the um, expectation and support and permission at times, and then also the actual um, the positional authority to connect, right. right? Yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, we can't accomplish this solely through what I'm about to say, but what I'm about to say might be uh, a small part of the solution is encouraging folks who are going for doctoral or terminal degrees to consider doing advising topics mm -hmm. um, if they're working as an advisor um, and to convince their, you know, uh, their their doctoral supervisor that advising research uh, is not only possible, but necessary. 
And so I've had that opportunity through students going through through our PhD program. Now, obviously, our PhD program is in academic advising, so the topics are going to be academic advising. However, myself and, and several other people have gone through doctoral programs that weren't academic advising and have done academic advising topics. Um, and so anybody out there listening who's thinking about this, I would encourage them to, to maybe consider uh, contributing to our knowledge base, you know, a, as along your journey of uh, doctoral coursework. And speaking of graduate uh, education, good uh, segue. <laughs> well, that, that was, you know, another part of the sort of through lines of conversation in your previous appearances is your work in analyzing and looking into the graduate education and the coursework uh, around academic advising, at least in the United States and North America. Um, and I'm kind of curious, again, for those who maybe didn't read the publications or um, haven't been in the presentations like I was, um, is there anything that you found or that was an interesting takeaway? Um, or is there anything new in the world of graduate education academic advising uh, that you would like to share here? Yeah, so many thoughts. So uh, I'll start with my kind of my own interest. So I did our, uh, the, the, the program for which I'm faculty now, I went through um, the graduate certificate in 2008 and the graduate master's degree in 2010. Um, I'm now faculty for that program and we are examining the program itself now um, because, you know, the, 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 the field, the scholarly base of academic advising has absolutely come so far. When you think about the, the 2008, uh, which was the second edition of the Handbook of Academic Advising, that now is several books. And so we've just branched out in so many important ways. And we need to be thinking about academic advising now as an academic discipline. Um, I have, I continue to come back to, and I think it was just an editorial, but Kuhn and Paddock, when uh, they wrote about thinking about academic advising as an academic discipline, I think it was really important forward thinking that they were doing. It's taken a while for the field to, to kind of catch up to that, but that was followed by Schaefer's, the professionalization, not just Schaefer, but Schaefer at all, professionalization of academic advising in, in 2010. And they found that there was an issue with, with schooling and, and, um, uh, academic preparation for for working in a profession, but so so that's kind of where where my interest in this has started. It actually started before I was faculty at Kansas State University, and so one of the first conversations I had with my department chair is, okay, I'm faculty for this program, which was the the first master's degree and the first PhD in advising. I, I'm not sure if we can say we're the first uh, certificate or not. I think Sam Houston may have been, you know, early on there too. But so I'm faculty for this now. If I am successful in what I am doing to promote a culture of professionalization of academic advising, there are going to be more competitors or graduate certificates and master's programs. And I sort of had to get her, like, not because she expected it, but I felt I needed to get her okay with this. Like, I'm encouraging more competition is, you know, that that might be antithetical to our goals in terms of, you know, our own program. And she said, absolutely not. You know, that's your research agenda. It's important. And this is what you need to do. So we are seeing an increase of graduate certificates um, not only across the country, but, you know, starting to pop up in other countries, too. And um, I think there were, I don't remember exactly, tw maybe 12 to 15 graduate certificates uh, at the time we wrote the article. And the article is is a case study, It's but it's it's a different type of case study. Normally, when you think of case study, you're thinking of a program, something that's bounded. We actually were articulating the boundedness of the case study around an idea, mm. excuse me, rather than a particular program. So the article um, uh, looks at uh, uh, data from leaders in the, the field of advising about the ed notion of graduate education, you know, considering things like, do we think everybody should have a certain um, preparation to do academic advising, i.e. have a degree in advising? Do we think that, um, you know, if, if they don't, that disqualifies them? Do, if there is a program in academic advising, do we want this some sort of standardization across these programs? Um, 
so th this is very early thinking about these issues. Um, and my own personal view is that there is too much value to people coming from different backgrounds to force everybody to have a degree in academic advising uh, to practice advising. But I do think it's something that we should consider in terms of thinking about, do we want a common understanding? Do we want some sort of standardization, um, whether it's, you know, a, 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 you know, a, a micro credential, whether it's some sort of certification. Um, so we we are seeing a number of, of programs develop um, just within the last, actually, as that piece was going to publication, I was notified of a, a second master's program uh, out of uh, Rowan uh, University in New Jersey. And, you know, as somebody who's faculty for this, you might think my response would be, oh, no. But I was actually very excited that that there are more programs coming in this because I am I'm passionate about this field. I think that uh, more and more people are interested in thinking about academic advising as a discipline. And once we think about academic advising as a discipline, as an academic discipline, the next thought is training, academic training uh, in, in, in such a discipline. I think I think we're going to see another PhD program at some point in academic advising. And that to me is very exciting. Right. And one of the things that I've heard you talk about before um, is this idea that the opportunities, if you want to call them outlets or channels or spaces or whatever you call them, the more there are, the more opportunity there is for discourse, yes. uh, for conversation, uh, perhaps even disagreement. Um, and whether the uh, conversation, disagreement, debate or discourse leads to a similar kind of uh, consistency in perspective or not, I know is a concern of the professionalization question. Um, are we are we moving the understanding of ourselves and understanding of advising by others forward to the level of respect and place and um, all of the sort of markers of a profession? Um, one of the things that you developed uh, in your work is uh, this grounded substantive theory with a model that explains in a sort of general sense what academic advising can be um, or perhaps should be. Um, and I'm again, I, I know a lot of folks are familiar with the work, uh, but I'm kind of curious, um, you know, since publishing and putting out uh, a visualization uh, of a model of advising in a sense of a, a theory of academic advising. Um, what's the response been? What has your experience been with having that out in the world? Yeah, thank you for, for bringing that up. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up, before I go there, I'm glad you brought up disagreements. It is so important for us to be able to disagree with one another, to be able to have constructive conversations. I think advisors by nature are very friendly, agreeable people. And there is this temptation to think like, oh, no, if I disagree with someone, that's a problem. Um, both Ryan and I have been part of the, I'm, I, I always get this name wrong, Theory, Philosophy, and History of Advising, I think, uh, community. Yep. And we are a group of people who who uh, not only are okay with disagreeing, but actually welcome it uh, because it leads to, to, you know, transformative thinking or, or challenging us to, you know, to further grow. And so... I would like to encourage uh, other advisors uh, to, to think about disagreeing respectfully as being okay uh, and as being important to advancing the, the field forward. And so one of the re one of the ways that leads to this grounded theory is is thinking about advising and whether there needs to be a common purpose of advising or not. That is something that is discussed at length and the professionalization literature is is whether there's a common theory or a common purpose, um, even if it, it, it differs in certain settings in, in small ways, but maybe kind of have a universal agreement about what's at the core or the essence of, of the nature of the work that we do. And so as I was is doing my dissertation work, you know, um, I studied broadly the professionalization of academic advising. So my participants discussed lots of different things, a career ladder, which is something we could also talk about, um, you know, graduate coursework and, and, and this, the, the purpose of advising. And so from this model uh, or from this uh, dissertation uh, uh, data, 
uh, I was able to kind of put together what I was seeing as a model of the academic advising process. So grounded theory as a methodology seeks to articulate a process. Uh, that's sometimes misunderstood, but that's what the what a grounded theory is doing. And so I wanted to, to visualize a process. And so my model consists of four different stages. And the first stage is, is representing the advisor as a caring institutional representative and the advisee, and that space being a place of connection. And it is only through that space of connection that anything productive can happen after that which also goes back to the importance of caseload size and being able to have that time and space to develop the rapport and the relationship with the student. And so from that place of connection, uh, students will grow and develop as they synthesize with their advisor uh, their experiences. And as they do that, it will lead to a place of decision making where they need to make a decision. The decision can take place either within the advising context itself or as the result of uh, it, uh, the advising experience. And from that leads to action or acting, as I call it. And acting um, on those decisions um, and uh, other uh, experiences that the students are going to have uh, outside of that. And this all leads in my kind of idealized version of academic advising to helping the student create an academic identity development. And so the most important question I believe advisors can ask students are actually two. Who do you want to be and how do you want to live your life? I think those are the two questions that are at the core of advising. And how can we get to that if we're so focused on lifting holds or you know, explaining, a, you know, sometimes explaining a policy is important, but I think too often it's that informational aspect that is stressed and it's not always the advisor's fault. In fact, it's rarely the advisor's fault because they have so little time and these are the things that need, you know, need to be covered. But I think that's where we get to the PR problem with advising and we need to really think creatively about the, 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 the really important work that we do. And I think it comes down to those two questions. So a lot of your work uh, in scholarship and publication, but also in presentation and your involvement um, in professional organizations is collaborative. Um, and another sort of through line of your conversations in the podcast have been about the folks that you've gotten to work with, the people who've made a difference for you, mentoring and guiding and influencing you. And I'm kind of curious if you could reflect a little bit here on any particular folks who've mattered a lot um, or who ha had experiences with you that really propelled or shifted or influenced your direction. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the first name I'll mention is, as, as maybe many readers know, is, is Lee Schaefer. Um, I had the absolute pleasure of, of getting to know Lee Schaefer on, on a personal level just about a year or two before his untimely death. And I will always be forever grateful um, that I was able to, to meet with Lee Schaefer. And um, anything I do, you know, I reflect, I, he, I mean, he's a dad figure. I've, I've actually lost my own father too, and my own mother. Um, but Lee Schaefer, when, I, when I'm thinking through the, the scholarly questions and the, the accomplishments and things I've published about professionalization. It's like, I want to ring Lee Schaefer up on the phone. Um, so reading his article in 2010 changed the, the absolute direction of my, my life. I was going to say my life's uh, uh, work, but actually my entire life too. Uh, and it, it, you know, has never changed from, from examining professionalization uh, so Lee has been very important. Um, Mark Lowenstein's work has been important. Uh, Peter Hagen and working on the scholarly inquiry book with Peter and uh, Samantha Grizarian. That was the easiest project I have ever had, not in terms of like the difficulty, but uh, it, it, it was still rigorous and, and, and we did the work, but in terms of how smoothly that process went, uh, it, it just was a dream team. So both of them have been very important and influential. Um, Kathleen Shea Smith has been 
uh, such an important uh, thinking partner with me. Um, we presented together, we've been friends for years, but we actually presented together for the very first time last year and we've never published together. And both of us think it's absolutely hilarious that we've you know, been thought partners and, and good friends all these years. And yet our work has been kind of in, in separate parallel lanes. Uh, Jenny Bloom has, ha has just been a, a wonderful mentor for me. Um, I think her appreciative advising work is, is so important. I think uh, thinking from a, a lens of positivity and strengths based is, 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 is really important. Um, so, and at the end of the day, my, my dissertation advisor, um, I was kind of hungry for learning about publication when I, I met her and, uh, and <laughs> She just fed that monster, uh, and we're still working together. Tanette Rocco is her name. We're still working together uh, to this day. Um, there's been so many others, but uh, these 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 people have have mentored and guided me. And you know, I also have been collaborating with students and, and newer researchers uh, upcoming in the field. And I've published and written alone, but frankly, it's just not as fun. I am a collaborative animal. And if I can collaborate with somebody, I'm going to do that way before I'm going to work on something alone. <laughs> right. And speaking of one of those collaborations with an up and coming researcher and a, and a student of yours, um, we were actually had our paper, our scholarly papers um, paired at the Orlando conference, um, as well as the Portland conference. Um, and so that's been two years in a row that we've been in the same sort of presentation space, having conversations around the scholarship and, and what I often think of as the big questions of academic advising. Um, and so can you briefly talk about as far as your perspectives on the importance or value of the scholarly paper session type at annual conferences? Yeah, I was I, I've been so thrilled by the, the development and I know. Uh, you and Wendy Troxel and others have worked so hard to get this up and going. Um, it is absolutely essential if our field is to grow uh, to have these scholarly papers. Um, and I'd like to see it expanded. Um, I think we need to be thinking about conference proceedings, uh, thinking about expanding the number of sessions um, and the, the, the scholars and researchers who are out there with their brilliant thoughts uh, but that are kind of kept silently in their head. Um, I want to encourage you to come out and uh, to, to, to do what needs to be done to, to share that work um, because that's how we move forward as, as, as a field. Um, so I have encouraged uh, my PhD students in particular, you know, you're working on your dissertation. It's about advising, you know, let's get a scholarly paper for you going. Um, and so I've worked in particular with Michelle Strobridge, um, and she is working on her dissertation is examining the experiences of navigating feminism for uh, primary role advisors who identify as, as women. And um, she's just having a fabulous time doing this and thinking about this. And one of the things uh, she did was to start thinking about a feminist lens for examining kind of a feminist approach for academic uh, advising. Um, and so there are a number of approaches in advising that are, have been articulated and they're, and, and they're wonderful. What we sort of feel is missing from many of them is thinking about the identity of the advisor and what the advisor is bringing to the advising session. And so that's where um, some of these uh, feminist principles uh, are, are coming into play. And so I hope you'll also mention your paper because it was just an absolute dream that we were paired together. And I, I loved learning about your your work. And, you know, as discussed, you probably have about three papers or maybe even a book out of that paper. Well, we'll see what happens there. But I, I will say it is um, always evident to me that so much of the people doing the talking about academic advising don't look like the people doing the work of academic advising. Yeah. And um, that was really the inspiration uh, that led to my um, my explore my exploration of the history of advising, um, and particularly the role of deans of women. Um, and so, yes, I was thrilled to one be a part of the scholarly paper session development and that process. But again, shout out uh, to Dr. Wendy Troxel on her just absolute 
championing of the importance of that and getting it done, which getting any of those things done can be such a challenge. Uh, yeah. But then uh, to get there and see that, oh, there's a chance we can have two folks talking about um, feminist perspectives, ways of understanding, ways of knowing, um, academic advising uh, in, a, in, in one, a way that might might connect a bit more with the folks uh, who are uh, primarily doing the work of advising, at least in the United States. Um, and so uh, that was really exciting. Uh, I know we have to be mindful of time. Um, as a faculty member, you have class coming up. I um, do. So one of the things that I will say to our, um, our, our listeners um, is another part of listening to Dr. McGill's uh, appearances on the podcast and, and reading your work is that a lot of the stuff that you're poking at uh, asking questions about problematizing are what I think of as the big questions for academic advising. Physics as a, a, a scientific discipline has this tradition of sort of defining, you know, what should be we what should we be working on as scholars in our field? What big questions uh, should we be answering and exploring? Um, and I know that Craig is among those who is uh, illuminating those big questions through his work. Um, but I'm kind of curious if you had one big question uh, you wanted answered, uh, set as an agenda for scholars uh, across the world for academic advising, what would it be? Well, I think I've alluded to it. Uh, why are, the, it sounds like I'm blaming it. I don't mean to be doing that, but maybe what can we do to, to help others understand the complexity of advising? Mm. I think it's such an important question. And I think we have not even even i mean there's just so much within that question to, to explore um and and many brilliant thinkers before me have have explored it as well i'm thinking of janet schulenberg uh and, and marie lindhorst mm -hmm. who wrote just an absolute pivotal uh important article about what advising is and that was 2008 and we've come a long way but i think Part of that has been siloed. It's been conversations within an echo chamber of people who know what advising is and how important it is. So how do we advance that? How do we improve uh, our PR message uh, to, to people who have real power um, uh, to, to, to make changes within advising practice? Absolutely. Well, if Matt will let us do it. Maybe there'll be a chance we can have another time together where we talk about those big questions. Oh, I, I, know there are folks, I know there are folks out there who want to also put their two cents in. So, you know, reach out, um, let us know what your thoughts are about big questions and about the things. Thanks so much, Craig, for your time, Thank for, you. your work, for, uh, for your collaboration. It's been a pleasure. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, oh, oh.